his staff, you shall do my wonders. Chris, are we on? Am I? Oh, great. <coughs> well, we're sorry for the abrupt ending on that clip. It starts to get a bit gruesome for children <laughs> after that point onwards. And so, uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to be able to share some of this story um, with you. Um, we're going to continue with, with the story of Moses. You know, it's, it's interesting when you, when you read a story like that, or when you hear it read over you, or when you see a clip like that, do you ever imagine what it's like to be an Israelite? Do you ever imagine what it would be like to stand there thinking, is God going to pull through? Is God going to pull through? Because they'd had 400 years of God not really doing anything with them, not, nothing noticeable, nothing tangible. They were longing for God to move. And then suddenly this man comes into their life and starts to bring change. And I imagine there would have been a lot of mixed feeling with the Israelites, wouldn't there? You know, especially when they came to that moment. So, so the story so far. What do we know from the story so far? Well, we have a people, an oppressed people, a people who had been in slavery for 400 years. Like we said, this man comes into their life that's sent by God. And John, John portrayed that brilliantly last week, if you were here last week to hear that. If not, listen to it online. Sends a man into his life. Into, into Egypt to announce freedom for the captives. The Israelites, long story cut short, the Israelites are led out of Egypt and brought to this moment of freedom. And that's, that's the Israelites, that's the story that we have for the Israelites. But again, probably lots of mixture of emotions, feelings towards what was actually happening to them. And then, and then we have Moses. Now for Moses, um, he has a story in the heart, doesn't he? You know, he leads these people who are literally at the edge, literally at the edge of their story. And he has to lead them somewhere. Now Moses goes through quite an ordeal, doesn't he? If, if you know the preceding chapters, you know that Moses really struggled with who he was. Moses really struggled with his own identity, with trusting that God would move, that God would actually do what he said he was going to do. But the Israelites were literally brought to the edge, the edge of themselves, but also to the edge of life, literally, were they going to survive this moment? And I want to just get you to explore today what that might feel like. Have you ever been brought to the edge? Have you ever been brought to the edge? In life, you know, life can throw certain things at you, can't it? You know, we've had that in our lives, that God, in his providence, allows us to go through certain things for his glory, and, uh, but it doesn't mean those things are always easy. And so, let's stand at the edge together today. You know, every moment in life in some ways is an edge. It's some way a call to move forward. And this is Moses' story. He leads a people to the edge. But what's interesting, how old was Moses at this point? Does anybody know? 
in his 80s. In his 80s. Anybody in their 80s here? June Bedford. <laughs> June Bedford. And some more. And some more. You know, what an amazing thing to think that in his 80s, God started to bring a new story into Moses' life. In his 80s, God started to work something so deep that would radically change the history of the world. And so in our 80s, we should be starting out, not slowing down, as I'm sure these two will testify to. You know, it is amazing that God would work something so deep in himself. You know, but Moses, he doubted a lot in himself, mainly in himself, and struggled to believe that God would actually use him. And he, he didn't have a great relationship with the people, did he? You know, he, he went in to, to speak to Pharaoh, and things got harder. You know, has, if any, has anybody ever prophesied over you, said things are going to go great for you? Or somebody shares some encouragement, you know, God's going to work this, and things just get harder? Has that ever happened to you? Or you have a desire in your heart, you go, God, I'm all out for you. I'm set that you are going to change my life, you are going to use me for your glory. And then things just start going blooming hard. You know, things start getting harder, because the Lord is working. And that is true, that when the Lord starts to work in your life, things can get hard. Things can get hard. But the Lord will work something so deep in you that prepares you for a glory moment, for a moment that he is able to move in you. But there's another story. So there's a story of the Israelites. There's a story of, the Mo of Moses. But also, there's a greater story. There's a greater story. And as we are sat here today, God is working out a greater story. And that greater story is the story of redemption. It's called the grand narrative. And so from Genesis, from when God creates everything good and perfect, and then we see Adam and Eve choose to disobey God. We see this moment of unraveling of God trying to call his people back to himself. And we know that in the last day, we will be saved. We know in the last day, there will be ultimate salvation in God as we dwell with him forever and him with us. So God, in the midst of all of this, is actually working out a greater story, a plan of salvation, a greater plan. And as you're sat here today, do you feel that about your own life? Because we can just, we, or sometimes when you step back from your life, you can just see your life, can't you? You just see what's gone before, your childhood, your adulthood, and the years to come. And you think, this is it, this is my lot. But actually, if you step back further, you start to see that God has been working through generations. God has been working throughout generations. In this church, how many generations have gone through this church? That where God has been working out his plan of salvation. But not just in this church, but in the world. Since Genesis to Revelation, God is working out a greater plan. That he is longing that people would be saved. So we've got the Exodus story. We've got the cross. The moment of salvation where Christ comes. And meets with us and dwells with us. So that's, that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to think about that part of the story, what Jesus has done, and our part in that. So what's your story? I'm not going to get you to come up. Um, but think about your story. Sat here today, you were at this point in history, aren't you? Look, look around the room. Just look at each other. Now can, can you see... You can't. That <laughs> God is working in each one around you. Whether you're Christian, whether you've given your life to Christ and you're trusting in him for your salvation, whether you're exploring here today, whether you're just wondering what faith is all about, what this Jesus is about, who he is. If you're here today, you are all on a journey. You've all got a story. You've all got a story. And God is working in your story. And it's weird to think that if you look to your right or to your left, you think, God is working here in each of us for his glory. That he is working out a plan. And sometimes we don't know what that is going to look like. You know, for some of us here today, you might share some of the feelings that the Israelites have. have a sense of hopelessness, like, God, are you moving? Are you doing anything in my life? Are you going to use me? Or you might just be on the top of the world thinking, I'm going for freedom. This is it. God is on my case. I'm out there. I'm going to see the Lord come. I'm going to see his kingdom come. Each one of you will be at a different place. Some of you will have hopes that you're working through. Some of you will have fears. We're all at a different point in our stories, aren't we? But the good thing is, is we're in this together. The Israelites were definitely in it together. 
and we are in this together. This is what makes church a joy, is that we get to share one another's stories. We all love a good story, don't we? Who's, who likes to read a good story? Yeah, we all love a good story. Um, but sometimes when we come to share our story, we have a mixture of emotions, don't we? You know, when we look back over our own story, sometimes we don't always feel like it's a good story, do we? We might see good moments along the way, or the other way around, it might just be an amazing story with the odd moment that hasn't been great. But sometimes there's pain, sometimes there's fear that comes up in us when we think about our own story. But what we need to know is that God is in our story. That God is working something out for his glory and for our good. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about as we work through that today. You know, what could have stopped at this moment, as the, as the people, as the Israelites were at this, the edge, what could have stopped them from getting freedom? What could have stopped them from getting freedom? They didn't if they didn't believe. Yeah, if they didn't believe that God would pull through, they would never have got free, would they? What else? Fear. Fear. Yeah, fear. Because they didn't actually know what was going to come, did they? You know, they were facing the river. They were facing the, the Red Sea. But they didn't know what was going to come next. They know the Lord had promised things over them, but they didn't actually know what was going to be in the land on the other side of that river. And that's the Lord, isn't it? You know, when the Lord speaks to you and says to go, he doesn't often tell you what's going to be there. He doesn't often tell you what's going to be there. And that's so true for our lives as a family, that the Lord has moved us from place to place throughout our, our lives. And, but he's always said, go. You know, to Abraham, what does he do? He says, go, go, go. Knowing that there'll be all the fears, the, the, um, the anxieties that we might face. But if we don't go, we don't get the freedom of that new thing that the Lord is working. But the thing that the Lord speaks over the people is not their faithfulness. Interesting, isn't it? He doesn't say, people of Israel, you've been amazing, well done. And because of that, I'm going to do this. What does he do? He declares his faithfulness over the people. He declares his goodness over the people. Let me read that to you. In um, in Exodus 3, God also says to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you. And what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt. That God declares his faithfulness, doesn't he? That God is going to do what he said he was going to do over the people. And we see this in 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians it says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. He is faithful, and he will surely do it. But what did the people need to do to see the Lord do it? Believe. Believe. Yeah, they needed faith, didn't they? And we need to remember this, you know, in times when, when we have nothing in and of ourselves. You know, at that point when the Israelites were at the edge, they had nothing in and of themselves to save themselves, did they? Nothing. They could do nothing to save themselves. You know, and that's our story, isn't it? That's our story of salvation. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. This is why we need Jesus. This is why we call on his name for our salvation. And it's not just a one-off that thing, that, that thing, is it? When we get saved, you know, you are saved, the Bible says. You are saved, and you are being saved. You are being saved, the Bible says. And you will be saved when we meet Christ face to face. We will be saved when we spend eternity with him. But in this present time, for those of you who are Christians in the room here, when you're looking at each other, you're being saved. You're being saved. What, and what's happening is the Lord is delivering you from, from hang-ups, from hurts, and from habits. habits. Yeah, not hangovers, as Rob Milton said. <laughs> um, yeah, the Lord is delivering you from those things. There is still a process of salvation, which we, in the Christian world we call sanctification, don't we? A, a redeeming from and bringing into. The Lord is doing that in you today if you will obey his call, if you will respond to his voice. That is what the Lord is working out in you.
What defines you? When, you, when you're sat here today, what defines who you are? God does. God does. That's good. That's the right answer. Jesus. <laughs> but that's exactly the right answer. That's the answer we want, isn't it? It's God does, of course. But what else can define us? You know, for Moses, what defined him? Let's have a look. Get my clicker to work. Oh, come on, clicker. Yes. For Moses, his past defined him. You know, when he, when he encountered God for the first time, when God calls him to the burning bush, what do we see of Moses? Insecurity, his past. His past weighed heavy on him. Because what had he done? He'd killed someone. He'd killed someone, hadn't he? He'd killed the Egyptian that was attacking one of his people. That would have weighed hard on Moses. Really hard. And if you think about our own lives, this is stuff when you look back at your own life that weighs heavy on you. You have stuff that you may have said, stuff that you may have done, stuff that you may not have done that just weighs heavy on you. And sometimes that thing can stop you from getting freedom. That thing can stop you from becoming all you're meant to be. And so what does Moses do? He trusts that God is bigger than his past. That his past is not going to define who he is in the future. And so to sat here today, what do we do with our stuff? When we look back at our lives, what do you do with the stuff that you go, Lord, this is how I feel about myself. What do you do with that? Well, we go to the Lord. That the Lord says he is faithful to forgive us. He is faithful to forgive us from all our sins, all our past, and lead us into freedom. That's the Lord's word over us. What else? People's opinions. You know, those people would have had an opinion of him. He would have been known as a murderer in that camp. People would have thought certain things about Moses. When Moses came to deliver the people, things got worse, and they would have remembered that. They would have doubted him. Do people's opinions shape you? I know they shape me. (laughs) They shouldn't do. I don't want them to. But I know they do. I know they do. And again, it's coming back to the Lord saying, it's not what people think, Lord. It's what you think. I heard Rick Warren do an interview. who is a pastor in the States. And he was talking about some controversial issues in the church. And he was being interviewed by Piers Morgan, who's quite a gruesome interviewer if anybody (laughs) sends you interview people. And Rick Warren, in response to some of the challenges that this this, uh, interviewer was doing, he just says, you know, the person I give an answer to in my life is the Lord. I give an answer to God for my life, not to man. Not to man. And, uh, and we see this with Moses. We see this shift in him when he starts to give more regard for what God has said than what the people are saying over his life. What's nice about the Lord is, and what's nice, what's great about the Lord is, is that he redeems he redeems. You know, to redeem something is to take something and give it worth again. Give it worth again. And so I want to encourage you, if you look back over your life and you just think, is it possible the Lord could give worth back to me again? Yes. That is what the Lord is about. That is who he is. Because of who he is, he brings us back into a right place with him and with each other. So let's not be defined by our past. The interesting thing is that those, those things would have had a real effect on Moses as he was stood before the Lord. And sometimes it's not about dealing with what's been said over us. Sometimes it's for some of us, and for me sometimes, it's about what we say over others. Over our partners, over our, our husbands, our wives, our children, our friends, our enemies. You know, the people around us who we just, ah, oh, they just grate on you. You know, what opinions do you share about those people? You know, I I want to be a man that speaks well over other people and about other people, especially when they're not in the room. (laughs) You know, because the Lord speaks well of us. The Lord speaks well of us. He speaks truth and hope and future into our lives. And and so the the scriptures speak that over us. You know, in Corinthians it says that that love is patient, it's kind, it's forbearing, But also, it believes. It believes for others. It believes for others. It has faith for others. So let's be a community of people here at this church, or wherever we are, that speaks well about people.
For Moses, this story was all about his identity. It was all about unravelling who he was, and in the midst of who he was, gaining purpose. Now this, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, that the Lord is working in you an identity that is found in Christ. But not just for your own blessing, but for who? For the world. For his church and for the world. You know, the Lord is stirring up something in you for his purposes. You know, Israel, it's interesting that it, um, the Bible calls Israel God's son. You know, and, and what are we? We are a child of God, aren't we? For those who are saved, we become a child of God. We are adopted into the family of God. That changes the way you think. That changes the way you think. Could you remember that moment, you know, when you look at a child and they look up at a parent and they just know they're loved regardless of what they do? You know, that's, that's God. That's God. When he looks towards us, he wants a heart that goes, I'm a child of God. I belong to God. I'm part of the family of God. Then we go back to Moses. So what kept Moses secure in the place of leading the people? He learned how to abide. And isn't it funny that Jesus then in the New Testament teaches us how to abide? How to abide in him. John 15 it says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me and I in the vine. And I am, sorry. I am the vine, you are the branch. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, Moses learned that his effectiveness in his walk with God was based in the presence of God, it was based on how he related to the Lord, how he surrendered to God. And that's challenging sometimes. I don't know about you, but if you think about surrendering some things in my life, you know, that's challenging. Sometimes letting go of some of those hurts, those habits and those hang-ups is hard, isn't it? Really hard. But the Lord is wanting to do something in you that frees you up to abide in him, to know him, to be effective in him. And these are some words that, we, um, that are associated with, with abiding. Dwelling, enduring, remaining, obeying, following, paying attention to. You know, to, to dwell in the Lord is to find your home. To find your home. You know, when you just get home, have you ever been on a long journey and you drive back and you go, oh, I'm home. Margaret, coming back from America, I'm sure you felt that. Oh, I'm home. It's a lovely feeling, isn't it? It's a weird feeling, but it's, it's a great feeling. I'm home. I'm home. And, and for the Lord, that's what he wants us to feel when we align ourselves with who he is. When he speaks things over us and he causes us to say, Lord, I want to abide here. I want to be in your presence. I want to be nowhere else as I walk with you, but with you. I want to know you. I want to dwell with you. Moses knew that. Moses knew that he needed the presence of God or else he had nothing. To endure. How many times have you given up? Even just for a couple of minutes in your faith? God, oh, it's just too hard. You know, when someone annoys you, when you heard someone spoken badly about you, Oh, Lord, really, do I have to forgive them again and again and again? You know, the, the Lord is working something in you, but he says endure, endure. Why do you think the Bible says endure? Because you're going to need to endure. You're going to need to endure. You're going to need not to give up. There will be moments in our lives when we want to just, oh, Lord, this is too hard. And he says endure. The reason he says endure is not because he wants, just wants us to have hardship. It's because he wants us to have freedom. He wants us to know life. He wants us to know him. And then he says, remain. Remain. Remain in him. You know, the world will offer you lots of different things. The world will offer you lots of different things, whether that's glory, whether that's riches, lots and lots of things, favour. But the Lord says, remain here and I will be your, your supply. I will meet all your needs. And Moses got to remain. Obey. We don't like that word in our culture, do we? Obey. Obey. But isn't it a joy to obey someone who has only got the best for you? Isn't it a joy to obey someone that's only got the best for you? The Lord only has the best for us. 
It might not always be easy to go through that process, but he always has the best for us. And then follow. What did Jesus say to the disciples? Follow me. Follow me. He didn't just say, do all the things that it says in my word. He says, follow me. It's relational. It's being connected with Jesus, being connected with God. And then pay attention to. Pay attention to. When the Lord speaks, do you pay attention? Dave Burton spoke about this the other week, didn't he? About the Lord saying to put your hand on someone, was it? Put your hand on someone and he, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then, I think he said he did it in the end. He put his hand on someone. And that person was just really blessed by, by his obedience, by him stepping out. You know, and God says that when we obey, we bear much fruit. When we abide in him, we bear much fruit. This is the normal Christian life. You know, it's not just about doing rules and rituals, of being, trying to be the best person we can. It's not about that. But the Lord says, abide in me. Because when you abide in Christ, when you have affection for him, he shapes you. You know, so where's the easiest person to be a Christian? In the hour on a Sunday morning. I don't know about you, but I feel quite Christian on a Sunday morning for an hour. Does anybody relate to that feeling? I'm quite nice to people. I'm, I'm very worshipful. But the challenge is outside of that hour, isn't it? The challenge is outside of that hour. And, and I'm like, Lord, you know, work in me a, wor- a worshipping heart. Not just an hour of worship, but a worshipping heart that longs for you, that has affection for you. That God says, do you love me? If you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll obey me. You will do what I've commanded you to do. And I I just want to be a man. I just want to call you, as men and women in here and children, let's obey God. Let's obey God because at this church, at this time, for his purposes, we will see mighty things happen as we start to pay attention to the Lord and what he is doing. Moses' call is, is our call. What was, his, what was Moses' call? To lead people out of slavery and lead them into freedom. Lead them out of slavery and lead them into freedom. And what is our call? To go and make disciples. What is making disciples? Calling people out of slavery and leading them into freedom. The slavery of sin and leading them into the freedom that's found in Christ eternal life, eternal life, and also the freedom that we know today as we walk with him. That uh, The Bible says that we have been given a ministry of reconciliation, to call people back to God, not to just be called back to God, which we are. We are called to be near to God and be connected to him, but he also calls us to call others back to him. That is our call as a people. So in conclusion... This is a story of salvation, that God is saving you today. For those of you who haven't given your life to Christ today, give your life to Christ. He wants to save you and give you a new hope and a new future. For those of you who are saved today, know his call on your life. Know his call on your life. He's saying, will you follow me? Will you follow me? Because God is a good God and he will lead you to good places. The Lord is calling all of us into freedom and calling us to lead others to him. I'm going to, um, I'm going to just take a few minutes. I'm just going to play a song over you. And it will be a song that's unfamiliar, but it really speaks to the heart of God and what God is doing in our lives. I'm hoping that as I've been speaking, the Lord's been speaking to you. It's always a better voice to hear, isn't it? The voice of God. And I hope that as you think about what we've gone through today, the Lord might be stirring something that you can give to him. Some of it might be your past. Some of it might be fear of the future. What the Lord might do if you say, okay, I'll follow you. Some of it might be hurts. It might be hang-ups. It might be habits. But this is a day of standing on the edge. And the Lord says, will you cross over? Will you cross over? Will you trust? Will you trust? And so I'm going to play this song over you. And at the end of the song, Heather's going to... Heather, if you want to come back up, wherever you are, Heather. 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 <laughs> sure, to come up. Heather's going to... Um, we're going to continue then in worship, but just let this song minister to you as you hear the words um, over it. Let, it. let it minister to your soul, but also let it be a time of response. Let it be a time when you can do business, as we say, with the Lord, as you can confess your sin, confess your fears, like Moses did, and meet with him. So stay seated. 
And, um, and after this song, Heather will continue in worship with us as we'll stand with her. team if you just need someone just to pray yes over you that the lord would work some of this stuff 
releasing you from the past, setting you up for the future. If you just need someone to stand with you and to pray that into your life, feel free to come forward. If there's anything else that you feel the Lord is working in you or you just want prayer for, the ministry team will be here to pray with you. So just come, just come forward, join. Please, let's be sons. Let's stand together.